Welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations, where it's a pleasure to welcome to the program uh, one more time. We've done it in the past, and I think we're destined to do it more often into the future as well. Uh, welcome to the program, Howard Bloom. And in my view, in the view of an increasing number of people, he's a major intellectual who has written most recently a book, which I'm going to display here or let it be seen, and it's called The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. A very interesting title, a tour de force, I'm here to say, in terms of an intellectual look at things in a very comprehensive context from the... Uh, structure of the physics of the universe to geopolitical realities on planet earth and this is the copy of the book we'll put it on the table here where you might come in on it again on the cover of the book it has the god problem will rock your world that's a, 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 a an accolade toward the book and to uh, our guest howard and that's from barbara ehrenreich uh, well known to many on the left, as it were, in the political system of the planet. And then also I have here, it's, it's not on the book, but this is um, um, uh, said about, of the book and of the author. It said, the God problem, how, and it says, this is, quote, next, they were talking about Howard Bloom and the author of the book, and it says, next in a lineage of seminal thinkers that includes just a few of the lesser known people of the intellectual realm, Newton, Darwin, Einstein, and Freud. And that's a quote uh, describing our guest, uh, and that's from Britain's Channel 4, a major source of television production in Britain and around the world scene. And Howard, once again, welcome so very much to Conversation. Great pleasure. It's a pleasure to see you. Yes, it really is. You, it is true, you've written on a book I, I've read nearly the whole thing. It's very big, a very large book, and you write so well, if I may, and you write so cogently about things intellectual and the interplay of people, and you do literally cover all the way out to understanding some of the latest understandings of the physics of the universe, string theory, this sort of thing, right down to the political. You are what would be called a comprehensivist, I would submit, <laughs> right? Well, once upon a time, yeah. I invented a field called omnology. Yeah, and, um, that's right. Right, that's and, good. and the reason for inventing omnology is because when you're a sophomore in college, yeah. and you're interested in theoretical physics, and yeah. you're interested in biology, and you're mm. interested in film, uh -huh. Anyone with a normal mind yeah. says to you, make up your mind. Yes, what right. are you? If you're not, are you going to be a biologist? Are you going to be a theoretical physicist? Or are you going to be a filmmaker? With all due respect, yeah. I think with the computer and linear regression, it's galloping towards specialization. Yes, it's, yeah, and it's well, a way of dividing and conquering the intellectual community through specialization. But we don't need to gallop towards specialization. Uh -huh. Yes, a small number of people do need to be specialists. Small, a, but it seems to be a characteristic of the whole endeavor. But we need a we need a balance of specialists and generalists. Well, with all due respect, we have practically no generalists or systems of systems thinkers. That's true. And, and it's that's, discouraged when the trends are very discouraged. Well, what I want a kid to be able to say yeah. is, I'm interested in film, I'm interested in theoretical physics, I'm interested in biology, and frankly, that's what makes me unique. I'm going to follow all three of those interests for as long as they hold me, and I'm going to continue following my bliss, following my passions, the Joseph Campbell saying, yeah. um, so long as my curiosities last. Why? Mm. Because when I'm 40 years old, um, and my friends are coming back with, uh, they, they don't know why, why they've wasted their lives. They don't mm. know why they're on planet Earth. They mm. buy little red sports cars and pick up lawns and cheat mm. on their wives mm. to give themselves a sense of some importance in the world. Mm. I'm going to be coming back with the fruits of my five curiosities, my three curiosities for the first time, and what I come back with is going to be utterly unique. Uh -huh. So that's an onologist, a person uh -huh. with an uh, omnivorous curiosity, with a curiosity that just won't stop. Do you think it's inherent in the, uh, in this, in the homo sapien consciousness that it is curious? You see, five-year-olds are curious and interested in everything. And they cat, really are. It's a mammal thing. Uh, um, mammal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cats okay. are, kittens are curious. They yeah. go exploring everything. They yeah. try pawing everything and see if it acts like a mouse. Right. Um, uh, laboratory rats are curious. They go sniffing around. Those little noses just go like crazy. Yeah. We're all curious. It's just that humans have a lot more 
facilities to be curious with. We mm. don't just have our noses, unfortunately, are nothing compared to the noses of rats and the, uh, and the noses of, of uh, yeah. uh, dogs. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, we have so many different ways of looking things with, at, at things with our brain, yeah. emotional ways, symbolic ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have to learn things by the grasp and touch. Yeah. Um, yeah, curiosity is one of the greatest things humans have. And we can begin to put things into perspective because uh, we're, we're also, it seems to me, unique in terms of evolution. Evolution seems to be, I tend to be secularly minded, as do yourself, I think, in terms of we're able to understand things without the mythic overlays that we've had to have in order to answer the dictates of a self-reflective consciousness capable of asking the larger questions what's it all about right. and so forth. But we've also had the capability of extending our consciousness through tools and technology with an interesting exponentially increasing effect upon the environment. I did geography. Right. We had a book, How Man Changes the Face of the Earth, right. Mankind. Right. right. So that we have a capability of that. So we're a unique entity in universe that is apparently being uh, the, the realities of which to the far reaches of the universe down to molecular structure and so forth of everything is becoming available to us in this time frame that we you live. You have to recognize though that we're not unique in changing the nature of our environment. Okay. And we're not unique in, let's put it this way, we're not unique in raping Mother Earth. Um, once upon, let me explain what please, I mean. Please, uh, please. Once upon a time, all life was in the sea. Yeah. And uh, the idea of getting out on the land would have been ridiculous because the land was utter barrenness. Mm -hmm. Ultraviolet ray rays were mm -hmm. hitting it. It was yeah. dangerous. There was right. nothing to eat. There was, mm -hmm. It was just raw rock. Right. And if you uh, believe uh, Charles Darwin's account yeah. of, of mm -hmm. uh, how, how worms change the nature of the planet, yeah. worms digest stuff and then what they can't eat, they shit out. Yeah. And what they shit out is what we call topsoil. Right, that's right. So the, or E.O. Wilson with right. consilience. So yeah, what yeah. we call nature, mm -hmm. uh, that is a landmass covered by earth and mm -hmm. covered by greenery, uh -huh. is something that worms made mm -hmm. by raping the raw stone of a pristine earth. You think if rape life, is maybe a, a loaded term? Well, yes, yeah, it's a yeah. very loaded yeah, term. Yeah, and yeah. It's a loaded term yeah. for a reason. <coughs> yeah. Because it's important to recognize that natural processes mm -hmm. are sometimes or often what we would call unnatural. In other words, they uh -huh. take the existing nature of things mm -hmm. and they change that nature. Well, um, it, it is true, apparently. Uh, well, yeah, okay. It, I think it's 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed on this planet, once evolution got started, right. have gone extinct. That's right. Okay. And so there there's been 142 an mass extinctions. So it mass. I thought of five major. There are mass six extinct. major mass extinctions, yeah, yeah. and mass extinctions come approximately every 23.5 million years. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So there have been a lot of them up till now. Uh -huh. um, and yes, it's quite true that uh -huh. nature discards species. Easily. Um, she's very, very careless in the way that she spends the lives of entire species. I wonder if there's any direction or point, Robert Wright and so forth writes on a direction and point or point of, di of direction to evolution itself. That's a question, whether there's any denying the laws of thermodyn the second law of thermodynamics okay, well, that all know, systems move toward you entropy. You know that, that this book has yeah. got five heresies. And heresy number three mm. is that the second law of thermo thermodyn thermodynamics, the mm. law of entropy, yeah. is all wrong. In fact, it's such ridiculous stuff that okay. it's astonishing to believe that serious people with good brains have ever taken it seriously. Yet it is taken seriously by much of the scientific the community. The entire scientific community. Sci yeah, the entire scientific community. Right. So how can we say that the entire scientific community is wrong? It's and, uh, very simple. In their, uh, the, yeah. the second law of thermodynamics says that all things tend toward disorder, all things tend toward entropy. And, um, to and the, the limits of a closed system. Well, but that's, part another, of the definition that's, a, the that's another matter. We'll do okay. closed systems and open systems at another point. Mm. But the, uh, the, the standard example to mm. demonstrate entropy is pick a sugar cube, drop it in a glass of water, stir with your spoon, uh -huh. uh, come back 15 minutes later and the sugar cube is gone. Yeah. But that's not the way the universe works. The okay. universe works in the opposite manner. The universe works by starting with a glass of water and producing a sugar cube. Uh. What in the world do I mean? Well, mm. once upon a time, there was nothing. 
absolutely well, nothing. Right. And then a all bagel. of a sudden, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden yeah. there was a pinprick infinitely smaller than a pinprick, and exploding from it came a raw sheet of space and time. Uh -huh. Now, going from nothing mm -hmm. to a pinprick, mm -hmm. that's a big step up. That sure going, is. Going from a pinprick to an exploding sheet of space and yeah. time. Yeah. Space and time, where did those come from? <laughs> yeah, They're right. Yeah. Brand new quality. Dark in the energy. Universe. Yeah. Dark energy. But where the hell is that? Yes, yeah, but yeah. that's another giant step up. Yeah. And then within 10 to the minus 30 seconds of a second later, mm -hmm. a really small sliver yeah. of a second, yeah. all of a sudden the space and time precipitated the way a storm cloud precipitates in raindrops. Yeah. It precipitated into the very first things, quarks and leptons. Yeah. That's another huge step yeah, up right, and yeah. we could trace the entire history of the cosmos 13.72 mm. billion years mm -hmm. and I can show you this universe jumping up stair steps mm -hmm. consistently for 13.72 billion years uh -huh. so to say as Stephen Jay Gould used to say yeah. oh there is no such thing as progress that's mm -hmm. just a value system of us humans an arbitrary one that we're I imposing on nature with, I loved your, your your thing with August Comte yeah you wrote so well on that positivism well yes so because that, August yeah, Comte yeah. here we have this bunch of people yeah. in 1850. Mm -hmm. Remember, Darwin doesn't come mm -hmm. out with the evolution of the species until 1859. Right. And we've got a little group of people mm -hmm. hanging around uh, at the at the dinner table yeah. of a guy named John Chapman, a publisher. Uh -huh. And it includes Herbert Spencer. It includes yeah. John Stuart Mill. Mm -hmm. It includes a guy named George Henry Luce. It Just includes, the name of a few of the less yeah, luminaries. It includes yeah. a woman named Marian Evans. It includes a guy who just got off of this big expedition, a yeah. voyage of discovery yeah. on a ship called the Rattlesnake, uh -huh. and is impoverished. He doesn't have enough money. Who that he was he's uh, he's a natural. Yeah. His name is Thomas Henry Huxley. Oh yeah, and, Thomas and, Huxley. Yes, yes, All and, and Thomas same. Henry Huxley mm. needs money to write mm. up his findings from yeah. his voyage on the rattlesnake. Yeah. So all these people are hanging around the same dinner table, yeah. and guess what they're discussing? They're constantly discussing evolution. Uh -huh. What? Evolution? What is evolution? How could they possibly yeah. be discussing evolution? Right. Charles Darwin's Evolution of the species is not going to come out for another nine years. Yeah. Well, guess what? Evolution. Wallace. Wasn't there a guy Wallace who was out there? There was it? Wallace, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. but evolution had been in the air uh -huh. way back around uh, 1800, uh -huh. actually 1795. Yeah, progress, Charles yeah. Darwin's grandfather, mm. Erasmus Darwin, right. had written two books about evolution. Absolutely. And yeah. what was missing from evolution mm. was a quote mechanism. Uh -huh. That's what was missing. But then Auguste Comte came yeah, along yeah, in the yeah. 1820s and 1830s uh, and he used the word evolution hundreds of times yeah, in his uh, books uh, because he was talking about the evolution of human history, the yeah. evolution of human society. Yeah. And uh, John Stuart Mill was mm. a huge fan of Auguste Comte. Yeah. And George Stu John Stuart Mill introduced this kid named George Henry Luce uh -huh. um, to the ideas of Auguste Comte. Mm. And, and it was his positivism, it was his ideas of evolution yeah. that were so fabulously yeah. discussed uh -huh. around that dinner table and you at John Chapman's so, you house. You write so well on that. Right. I, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you write so well about the internet linking all these people, and you write also with such good, well-toned humor. You bring <laughs> well, in that's humor very important. So good. But back to the beginning of things right. like that, uh, uh, back to, and that was important, and I, I, I got a quote I might get to from a fellow George B. Tyson, right. the son of uh, Freeman Tyson, right. and he's written a book here. I'll show it here. Maybe you can show it on a camera. This is a book that fell off the shelf the other day. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't. Uh, Darwin Among the Machines, The Evolution of Global Intelligence by George B. Dyson. We might read a thing from Herbert Spencer, or from Spencer that's there. But back to the thing about the... Uh, the universe in 13.72, I guess yeah. it is, billion years ago, the Big Bang. Um, and also whether this thing, because it seems to me it's part of the definition of the second law. And when you have a second law that we say is uh, counter to what most all the scientific community accepts. Right. The first law is no law, cons conservation of energy and right. so forth. But if you have a, a, a law that is th th like that, uh, it's it, it, it's incumbent upon try it, it, it is within the definition within a closed or open system whether the universe is a closed or open system That's is something a, that is up to synergistic right. realization of full fulfillment of string theory which come along in the last 20 years or so with uh, with uh, you know uh, that 
whether it's an open and closed system because there could be parallel universes. Well, explain to the audience what an open... whether it's a closed or open right. system is an important one in terms but, of defining... But explain to the audience what an open and closed system is and how it comes into discussions of thermodynamics. Well, wh whether the universe is open or closed is that if, it, if it's one system that you can get to, you understand the, the universe is synergetic in time. Right. The universe, in fact, maybe I could try and read this if you don't mind. No, go ahead. Okay, let me do it. This is a thing from, from, from Samuel Butler. Right. Okay, uh, back there. And this is Darwin Among the Machines. And this is something written in the mid 19th century and so forth. It's something to think about. And it's a little bit wordy in the 19th century way of speaking. As the vegetable kingdom was slowly developed over from the mineral, Okay, so there'd be algae and things that are coming, right. and that's the question, how did life get, or the constituents of RNA right. that began to get to where you could get to DNA and to evolution itself. Right. There are people doing research on that. Right. There's a way in how it's happened. Some guy got clay and this kind of thing of right. understanding how that happened. Um, and as in like matter, the animals supervened over the ve upon the vegetable, so now, in these last few ages, an entirely new kingdom has sprung up, of which we are yet, as we as yet have only seen what would will one day be considered the antediluvian prototype uh, prototypes of the race. Dot dot dot. As some of the lowest of the vertebrata attained a far greater size that than had been descended to their more highly organized living representatives. So a diminution in the size of machines has often attended their development and progress, dot, dot, dot. It appears to us that we are ourselves creating our own successors. Now you could think of that in terms of generations of successors of human beings, or you could think of that as the evolutionary process of development of species that leads to one, the Homo sapien, which is in a certain sense, I'm claiming, particularly adroit, and in, in terms of its consciousness, very unique in its consciousness, perhaps the leading edge of conscious evolutionary purpose, possibly in universe, uh, the Homo sapien species in relation to the others. But uh, success is giving them far greater power in supplying by all sorts of ingenious contrivance that self-regulating, self-acting power, which will be to them what intellect has been to the human race. So the purpose, is there a purpose or is there an arrow of purpose? Is there any purpose in terms that we can assign to, let's say, the evolutionary process or our existence in universe or, or not? And the second law of uh, thermodynamics would see in relationship to the cosmos, Fuller and others would see a, that it moves across, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the, the evolutionary process moves across uh, entropy and brings increased conscious pattern of understanding the process of which we are a part, which would have been unthinkable in the age of the dinosaurs or anything evolutionary in time other than the time of which we find ourselves. That kind of thing is right. what I'm trying well, to I'm, get at. Well, I think that you can see a clear progression, mm -hmm. and the clear progression is moving in the absolutely opposite direction that entropy would lead you to believe. Well, then um, that would be a positive thing. Kind it's a kind very of thing. positive thing. But again, remember the steps mm -hmm. in the universe. Yeah. Big Bang to space and time. What? Space and time? Radically ridiculous stuff. That's a big step up. The next step, quarks and leptons. Yeah. How do you get matter? By simply adding time and space to time and space. That's a big leap up. Um, a Quantum 300, mechanics. But 300,000 years down the road, we'll skip the plasma, we'll skip the fact that there were pressure waves and that there was a musical pattern in the cosmos according to theoretical physicists. Well, there was a musical pattern in the cosmos. When, when are you talking about This is during, you? there's a period from approximately one second after the Big Bang uh -huh. until 300,000 to 380,000 years after the Big Bang uh -huh. when everything is a scalding soup. Uh -huh. A scalding soup means that particles are smashing into each other at super speed like bullets hitting yeah. each other head on and yeah. ricocheting off each other and then immediately ricocheting off other particles at super uh -huh. speed and yet retaining their identity somehow. Uh -huh. Certainly not falling apart <coughs> into disorder. Uh -huh. And but even uh -huh. worse for the uh -huh. case of the entropists yeah. is this, that these particles that seem to be in an utter chaos uh -huh. are not. Uh -huh. How do we know that? 
because they come together and move apart en masse, like mm. Busby Berkeley dancers. How do we know that? Because That's we really see, good. Because yeah. we see the evidence yeah. of what, what are called pressure waves, these yeah. huge pressure waves mm. that span from one end of the cosmos to the other, rippling across the face of an entire universe mm. and in a form that is so harmonic, that is so uh, mathematically regular. It's beginning to sound like uh, b b b green. And yeah, well, harmonic that, and string uh, and all that. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. Um, the theory. scientists who discovered it say that it, they compare it to music and mm -hmm. they say the universe rang like a gong. Mm -hmm. Is that disorder? Uh -huh. That's in something that looks totally disordered. Mm -hmm. This ricochet, slam bang, bump up car soup, uh -huh. you'd expect no order and yet you've got mm -hmm. this massive mm -hmm. musical order. Mm -hmm. So that's the very opposite of entropy. But then, three, but, but then uh, 380,000 yeah, years after the Big Bang, mm. things begin to slow down. Mm. That's called cooling. Mm -hmm. um, and as they slow down, we've done this before, but yeah. you, you know, the coffee yeah. table at the beginning of the universe is yeah. in here, and you and I are sitting yeah, at the yeah, coffee yeah. table at the beginning of the universe, mm. and you're a bold visionary, mm. and I'm an old, crusty, cranky, cantankerous conservative uh, and and you tell me at the 380,000 year mark in the universe's existence you tell me that you predict that things are going to slow down and what's more you predict that when they slow down these things that relatively speaking are the size of the Empire State Building mm -hmm. are going to discover they have some sort of inanimate longing. I mm -hmm. say Harold this is anthropomorphism mm -hmm. this is not science yeah, things yeah. Objects, particles do not have longing, mm. and then you predict that these things, relatively speaking, the size of your fist, <laughs> yeah. are going to have an inanimate longing. Uh -huh. And Harold, I know you're crazy. That's yeah. anthropomorphism again. Right. These things are not going to have inanimate longing. Mm. That's crazy. Yeah. Particles don't have social feelings. Yeah, right. And then you say, what's mm. more, the little things the size of your fist are going to be precise, have a longing that fits them precisely uh -huh. to these things the size of the Empire State Building. Mm. And I say, Harold, what mm. planet mm. have you been mm. living on? Yeah, yeah. They, this is absolutely impossible yeah. things the size of the fist are going to fit precisely with things the size of the Empire State there Building. There could be a lot ridiculous. of examples of that, the things that are, that's synergetic. Yeah, synergetic right, exactly. Emerging. But you turn emerging out to be, properties. yes, yeah. and you turn out to be right uh, because the little things are called electrons and yeah. the giant things are called protons uh, and their inanimate lungs do fit each other with more precision than German engineers could ever, ever achieve. Even German engineers. Even engineer. German engineers, <laughs> yeah. right. And yeah. is this disorder? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is so far from yeah. disorder mm -hmm. that it defies imagination. Mm -hmm. Does every scientist on the planet have access to this story? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they know this, uh -huh. how can they possibly believe that the universe is constantly falling apart? Well, there might be a countervailing uh, element to it. That would be Fuller. Yeah. Fuller would posit that, that the evolutionary process is a countervailing force in the universe that is... Um, is moving across entropy and bringing increased conscious pattern of understanding that there is a purpose and a direction to evolution and to the human endeavor. Right, right. Okay? And Fuller would be right, and uh, the anthropists would be wrong. And that could be done within a secular context without having any kind of animating Absolutely. God or anything of Absolutely. that sort of thing. It's just understanding and knowledge is growing In fact, answering that kind of question, the, that's what the God problem is all about. Mm -hmm. It's about how, godless, does, yeah, a godless, how does a godless cosmos create? Yeah, but how now does, you're making an assumption, if I made the godless process, the, the godless pros, uh, cosmos there's been assumed by civilization, I guess, since eight, seven, ten thousand years ago. In Neolithic, there's been uh, this, or probably Cro Magnon cave people sat around contemplating the mastodons are big. This is really amazing. It must be created by some god or some cre some overarching entity that coheres everything. It's called God or various spirit uh, understanding because they had a self-reflective consciousness. Right. Which is unique, I would think. Oh, self-reflective consciousness. We haven't done adequate consciousness studies, that is, studies on whether consciousness exists. We don't know how to detect whether consciousness exists. This is a big problem. Well, that is another order. Yeah, things. and when you get right down to epistemolo yeah. epistemology, the philosophy yeah. of how we know what we know. Or um, ontology. Yeah, that yeah. you don't really know whether I'm conscious or not. Uh -huh, um, yeah. And I don't really know whether you're These conscious or not. These philosophical things. Yeah. One would wonder, well, one wonders, let's say, say, what was it, 70, uh, 70 was it 75,000 years ago? 65,000? The uh, 
Yucatan and the dinosaurs were done. Right. Then, right. There were dinosaurs. 65,000 years 65 ago, the meteor. 65 million year, the, the, years ago that the Yucatan was struck and everything. One can assume we know what the creatures were like. We just did a program with that fellow who, uh, Mr. Paul, uh, uh, Gregory Paul, he's an animation, he, he, he an illustrator of the, of the uh, Mesozoic, I think, yeah. of uh, the dinosaurs. So right. We have it. But one can assume that there was not at that level of evolution a consciousness such as is to was was to emerge in the future that gave self-reflective questioning of the larger right. issues of the universe. Well, one would assume. Or we, we, oh, here's what we know. Don't have when, that. When your dog, when you have a conversation with your dog, my your dog's dog, pretty smart. Aha! Uh -huh, yes, yeah. I know. I've met mm, your dog. Mm. We spent a lot of time together. Yeah, right. And your dog will cock his head and make facial expressions and make body movements that make you feel that this dog has as much of a consciousness as I do. The one thing we don't want, well, we do know, is this. Dogs do not have the kind of sophisticated language that we That's do. Right. Chimpanzees do not have the kind of That's sophisticated right. language that we do. No. Even Irene Pepperberg's parrots, no. which show remarkable abilities to mm. categorize things and mm. do abstract thinking, yeah. even they do yeah. not have the kind of complex language yeah. that we do. And when you add complex language to self-reflection... There's a sense of consciousness behind that complex capability. And there's a... There's a there's a movement in terms of an understanding of things in consciousness terms, in evolutionary terms. And think of how and much of your thinking... it's by mankind, it would seem to me, fair right. to say. Well, yes, it is fair to and say. And we're only here 200,000 yeah. years on a, on a scale of billions. Stephen Jay Gould would have said, no, you can't say that. That's, you're saying that simply because you're human and you're biased. But he's Why wrong. would he say that? Why would he or Eldridge say that? Uh, Niles he, Eldridge, it wouldn't have so. been Niles Eldridge. That was exclusively Stephen Jay Gould oh, territory. Really? Okay. Stephen Jay Gould said that because he is, what would we say? He was a, uh, a Marxist-oriented, uh, left-leaning uh, liberal mm -hmm. who felt that um, <clears throat> a claiming any specialness for humanity was akin to claiming specialness for imperialist uh, colonialists. And well, that'd be interesting to bring evolution into political terms in their right. everyday Right, and reality. you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can bring it into you political can, you terms. Can. We, you can. Things are related. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Uh -huh. And as a consequence, he shunned the idea, and it was very popular to go along with him mm. and say, oh no, there is no direction to evolution. But you can't possibly say that when you see how we go from space-time to things, how we mm. go from things to the first atoms, how mm. we go from the first atoms to these giant sweeping spirals called galaxies, yeah. how we go from the galaxies mm. to the point of gravity balls catching fire mm. and igniting yeah. called uh, suns, stars. Mm. Yeah. Um, all of this is a progression in complexity. Mm. It's, a pro it's a progression in degrees of order. Uh -huh. it's, com it's a progression in social terms. Social terms? Uh, How can you say terms. social terms? Well, you have to wait it over a little while because the social term is only going to come at the last uh, nanosecond of the whole existence of everything as we understand it. Social terms come at the very beginning. Well, okay. Social, social terms, terms come terms, at the very that's beginning. That's interesting because I associate that with the homo sapien species. No, yeah. social yeah. terms come okay. at the very beginning because yeah. remember, Okay, remember that giant unfurling sheet of space and time. Yeah. And remember how it somehow managed to clench itself together and yeah. turn space and time, raw yeah. space, time, yeah. and energy, yeah. space, time, and movement mm -hmm. into things, those mm -hmm. first quarks. Yeah. Those first quarks came complete with social rule books. Yeah. Those first quarks... Wait a minute, social... Why do you call it social rule Well, let me I, describe it to okay, you, yeah, and then yeah, you yeah, see if that's out, a fair way to describe it. And didn't we um, just find the boson, the quantum mechanics people? Uh, they happy. think they found the, the boson, but they're still, they're hedging, they're fudging oh, they're hedging a little their bit. Bets on, yes, on, they're hedging on, their bets on it, but it it's doesn't appear anywhere in this book. The, on the, the Higgs boson doesn't really interest no, me. No, it would have been much. too, it only just happened. If yeah, it did, right. You know, but but the idea has been around since the 1960s of okay, the Higgs yeah, boson. Okay, yeah, looking for the Higgs boson. Yeah. Well, but, but back to quarks, yeah, quarks okay? Yeah. Quarks cannot exist on their own. They can only exist in groups of two or three. So the task for quarks at the very, that very instant when they come flurrying, when they come blizzarding out of space and time, uh -huh. their immediate need mm -hmm. is to find partners. Mm -hmm. And if they don't find partners, well, they can't exist. They well, simply can't exist without partners. I got partners. a quote from this other book. I can't find it. But yeah, there's uh -huh. a quote in there from right. Dyson, from the right. young Dyson. Yeah. But there's more going on here than just needing to team up with others. Mm -hmm. 
there is something we call attraction and repulsion. Mm -hmm. um, a given quark, let, let's imagine you're a quark. Mm -hmm. if, a, if another quark that's exactly like you comes mm -hmm. moseying along, mm -hmm. you flee from it. That's repulsion. Mm -hmm. If a quark that's sufficiently dissimilar to you yeah. comes along, let's say it looks like Maggie, mm -hmm. um, and then the two of you glom onto each other like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Built into you is a rule book mm -hmm. of who to flee and who to embrace. Yeah. That's a social rule book. Mm. That's just as much a social rule book as Emily Post and an etiquette book. Okay, that's interesting the way you see it that way. Yeah, I use that term social. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Well, again, yeah. those first quarks yeah. are either trios or, or, quart yeah, yeah. or um, duos. Uh -huh. uh, they're not individuals. Mm. In there, there is, individualism is a relatively new thing in mm. this universe. Mm. Um, groupism is something that's been going on for a very long time. Yeah. Remember those pressure waves that rang like a gong? Yeah. Those were massively social. Mm -hmm. Those involved trillions and trillions of participants, dancers, um, subatomic particles. Uh -huh. um, the, and a galaxy is a massive social enterprise mm. undertaken by more by more elementary particles than we have words for. So it, it, the term social gets me, that's all, because right. I'm, I'm hung up on language. Like right. That, and I'm thinking that in terms of the modern or to the experience that we're used to in calling social uh, organization of uh, people. Right. Know? Yeah, yeah. Which well, is, uh, um, but it, it's a good it's a good use of the language. In yeah. the days of Marx and Engels, yeah. Engels used to ask the question, how did humans go from uh, strict isolation uh -huh. um, to families? Mm -hmm. Well, Harold, the answer is they didn't. Oh, that's a that's a that's a very direct kind of way. Yeah, of uh, art, sir. It, yeah. things go from mm -hmm. social to individual, uh -huh. not from individual to social. Yeah, the yeah. very first creatures yeah. on planet Earth, our yeah. foremothers, yours and mine. Yeah, um, they were here three and a half billion years ago. They're mm -hmm. bacteria. Yeah. Bacteria live in massive groups. These are groups so massive that a bacterial colony, colony the size of your palm, mm. is so thin you can't see it. Yeah. And yet it contains seven trillion individuals. Yeah. That's more individuals than all the humans who have ever lived. And yeah. they live as a complex society. Only 100 billion to human beings have lived apparently, and the, we all but, walk, but in here's a, the we walk in a sea of bacteria. We walk in a sea of bacteria, yeah. but these bacterial colonies are very tightly integrated. Uh -huh. They are knowledge processing uh -huh. machines. Uh -huh. There are groups of 10,000 that go out to explore the landscape and they send their messages out back. And you got to think about the honeybees. Too. And the honeybees too, but that's, that's, really interesting. that's so much later that it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, up so, the line, But the yeah. point is well, that... Well, it's later in time, so it's later in the evolutionary right. process that so, we're talking about. So at now. the very beginning, yeah. us social beings, or us, us living beings, mm. were living in groups of seven trillion. Wait a minute. That's yeah. big. That's not going from isolation. You mean, yeah, at the level of bacteria. At the level of bacteria, but yes, those again are our foremothers. Yes, million years ago, that's all there was. There were uniform, uh, unicellular sponge of Well, it was more like uh, 1.2 billion years ago because then we started developing um, multicellular, the first uh, the eukaryotic cells and yeah. stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one way or the other, the point and is that, that... that life, that process of going from mineral to ant to the earliest thing, that was probably about what, 3.5 That would have been 3.82 billion 3 .85, years ago. Yeah, right. I think, yeah. Right. That we and crossed the line from where the inorganic began to have the constituents of what was to be ri ribonucleic right. acid. Right, okay, that now and here's a big question yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. When we go from that transition to dead atoms and dead molecules yeah. to ribonucleic acids. And well, from, no, the, I think you have to go to the constituents of right. it. And this is over eons of right, time. Right. That's the thing you have to But nonetheless, when yeah. we go, when we take that course, mm -hmm. have we demonstrated entropy, things falling apart? Doesn't or seem. have we demonstrated things falling together? Well, that's what Mr. Fuller would say, that yeah. that is an anti-entropic function. Yes, but yeah. it's uh, you can't always say that uh, um, uh, you can't always put things in negatives, you no. know? If you coin everything in negatives, you're, you're conning yourself. Well, okay, maybe, but at the same time, now it's also very disquieting because one of the things is, uh, things happen in time and everything like that, and also we, 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 we live in my, there's a term that was coined, uh, my uh, fellow I really like, is, as you know, is Bucky Fuller, a lot of right. other people do. He coined the term, or he brought into use the term 
synergy, right. which is the behavior systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts. You could call right. it emerging properties. Right, it's right. something that comes unexpectedly. Right. It is happening. And that happens which all means, over the place. I know, but what it indicates is there are no absolutes in a right. certain sense. Now, there's no absolutes, so the idea of there being a God right. that would give an absolutist right. quality to something or anything like that, there are none of this through time because things are emerging that we did not know. We had Einstein, before Einstein, there was, a, you know, he, he developed a basic understanding of physics and then we get to quantum mechanics and they have a certain thing, the four laws of gravity and all that, weak laws. And they get to think, and then along comes Brian Greene. Right. And there would be a, in a sense, people would say that's forever. We right. we now have the physics of the universe. Right. We understand. It. And then along comes Brian, and that would be a closed system. Right. That would be entropy would be operative right. within that. And so we got a steady. And then along comes Brian Greene and string theory, and they say, well, this may not be the end of the universe, 13.7 billion years ago, because we may have. Ten dimensions, right. and we may have wormholes that right. connect parallel universes, right. like soap bubbles. Right. So it may be a closed system, it may be an open system. Right. It's up for grabs. Well, it's synergetic, and there's emerging properties in time that emerge. If okay, you can let's, understand, let's, so there's no absolute. Right, but let's uh, pull a few of these things apart. Um, Synergy is an extremely important concept. It means the behavior of systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts. Okay, now let's go back and to... He would use that term to a thousand people to right. give an audience of scientifically understanding. Right. Does anybody understand? That was in the 50s. Anybody know the word syn Nobody would know it. Right. Now every is on the ad agent, every ad agency's lips because it's really good for selling right, things. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now the deal is that you see synergies taking place from the very beginning of the universe and they're one of the major reasons that the second law of thermodynamics is bullshit. Okay. Um, and yeah, here's I, I, how. Wait a minute. This yeah. is network television. I guess it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Horse Pucky. Let's oh, call it Horse Pucky. Pucky. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And it's okay. all more. You know, yes. Okay, right. Yeah. Uh, a little more yeah. wholesome. No. It's, um, it's more. It's more. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, here's what what happens. Remember those quarks that came together yeah. in groups of three. Yeah. Well, now, if we used Aristotelian logic, mm. uh, Aristotle said that if you take things and reduce them to their elements, yeah. and you find the laws of those elements, yeah, right. you will understand everything you know about this, you need to know about the system. There's going to be emerging properties in time. That's what Aristotle fails to take into account. That's what I'm saying. That's account, kind of a utterly. biggie. That's right. a biggie. And yeah. that's where, yeah. in the emergent properties, yeah. is where the creativity of the cosmos right. of this book right. is after right, right. Uh, occurs. Uh -huh. but. Let's go back to those three quarks getting yeah. together. Uh, uh, you would think, okay, I'm going to take three quarks, I'm going to put them together, what would I get? Yeah. Three quarks, of uh -huh. course. One plus one equals two. Mm -hmm. One plus one plus one yeah. equals three. Three yeah. quarks. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happens. Mm. All of a sudden, when you get three quarks together, this whole new property emerges mm -hmm. and comes from nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it's radical. Mm -hmm. It's really different. It's the properties in one case with one kind of trio. It's the properties of what we call a proton. Mm -hmm. And in another case, it's the properties of what we call a neutron. Yeah. And those properties have nothing to do with the, just knowing the elementary laws of the quarks themselves. Okay, let's, let, let, let's go. One of the problems is in this universe and anywhere else is time, right? We only have so much time. Right. And let's get to evolution. Let's say we have evolution and we get to some of the more uh, uh, current uh, things. We have evolution, what is it, about 3.8 uh, billion years ago, the organic evolutionary process got started. Right. There's been 99% of the species that have ever existed has gone extinct. Uh, we get to the point where there's an evolutionary pattern that includes a wide and huge variety of emerging properties and great variety of vegetative and animal expression that makes up the uh, biosphere of this whole planet. Right. One of which is a hominoid line, right. which seems to be our ancestors. Right. We were then, we had Australopithecine four right. to seven million years ago, we can understand Lucy and so forth. And then it seems to me, as I understand, uh, that uh, from that, there came about 1.5 million years ago, Homo habilis, which right. is the direct ancestor. We were, as a species, contained within Homo habilis. Right. We did not exist. We were an emerging property right. in terms of that. And then 200,000 years ago, I think is the best guess, our species appeared. Right. Okay, and we get to that point, and uh, we've been here for 200,000 years. There's about 100 
billion people have existed as best the estimates over the whole of the course of the human experience. And where do we stand in evolutionary terms as a species now as we get to such a point of such exponential increasing capability for understanding in scientific, rational, intellectual terms the realities of the universe and of the larger uh, biosphere and so forth of this planet. Are we at a point of qualitative transformation at this point in time? Or where do we stand when we get to the point where we have weapon systems that are extensions of our technological right. capability that are species lethal, apparently, from right. The modeling? Right. Existentially new only since 1970 or so? Right. And where do we stand in terms of the materialistic organization of world society in terms of the haves and have-nots within human society that threatens, if it's not dealt with, to unleash the weapons that can stop conscious evolution. Are we at a time of qualitative transformation close on to what Stephen Jay Gould or Eldridge would say is punctuated equilibrium? Are we coming to the end of the human experience? No, in I, evolutionary don't think, I don't think we're okay, coming will we there ever? at all. Will we ever? Yes, uh, there, a, yes we will. Called, it would be called a synergistic emerging right. property, right. such as you indicated before in the physics could never happen. Well, we're showing yeah. this incredible ability to be stubbornly human, to, to be stubbornly- Well, we've had 200,000 years. Right, but we have uh, human nature. <laughs> Look, we've been going through qualitative transformations every five to 10 years. Oh, what do, what you, do I, I mean by that? What do you, no, I, no, quality, I'm talking, not yes. quantitative. No, qualitative. We've well, been looking through qualitative well, transformations. Well, well, explain. Okay. Um, in, uh, let's start at 1800. Um, in, in 1800, people were not much better off than they had been in the days of the Roman Empire. Um, they still, and the Roman Empire had these post roads where you could uh, take a horse, ride it for 40 miles, pick up another horse, a fresh horse, ride it for another 40 miles, yeah. and go 1,200 miles in three days. Astonishing. Um, Did that add up to that? Uh, well, I, I don't think that. I have adds to go up. back. I don't no, think I have that to go works. back and I have to go back and do the arithmetic yeah. again. But Constantine got a message. Constantine grew up in England, and he got a message that his father yeah. um, was seriously ill in Asia Minor, yeah. um, way over in the neighborhood of Turkey, someplace. Yeah, right, right. And he managed to do that trip in about something like three days, a okay. very short amount of time, again, by taking a fresh horse every 40 miles or so yeah. at a post house that was set up specifically for that purpose. What, 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 and I, my arithmetic could call be that wrong. A qualitative turn No, I, we I haven't mean, gotten to the transformations uh, okay, yet. Uh, um, in 1800, uh, Europe was actually not as well off as the Roman Empire right. had been. Uh -huh. um, then in Europe, we had the invention of the steam, steam, the engine. steam engine, yeah. right? And, and there was first the invention of the steam engine. The first steam engines before 1800, actually, yeah. were the size of a building, yeah, the I size know. of this yeah. building. They were very big. They went down to Cornwall for the copper mine. Yeah, that was the first right, exactly, to, to pull the water and out. Precursor but to this the is long before the locomotives. Revolution. And then you Invented had- the same year as the uh, Wealth of Nations by Adam right, Smith exactly. and the revolution in the colony. Right, and, and, then the you had, in and then you had Watt and Bolton, mm. who brought the size of the steam engine from a building down to something that yeah, was but portable. Why, I, what I want to get at is yeah. why are these, why do you see these as qualitative transformations instead of that being part of a quantitative change within a Well, context. let me give you a, just a very stark example. I mean, a qualitative transformation yeah. would be the emergence of the Homo sapien species as opposed to Homo habilis. That's well, qualitative. Well, you can tell me That's whether, I'm going to give you a candidate for qualitative change, and you tell me whether you think it's for real Well, or I gave not. you one saying there may yeah. be a new species emerging out of the I don't think so. human existence. No, I don't think so at all. Well, that would be qualitative. That would be qualitative. That would be big Well, time. let me give you an example, okay. and then you, you judge it. Okay. In uh, 1988, I, I, you know, I had done a 20-year field expedition into popular culture, which I knew nothing about. I know, and, and the music. Yeah, yeah and, and I founded all the, the biggies. Yeah, yeah, and I founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, for a science nerd. Bob Marley? <laughs> yes. I love Bob Marley. Yeah. And yet, well, did you ever meet Yellow more. Man? Yellow Man? No, no. Yellow no. Man was great. Yeah, yeah nope, reggae. never met him. Okay. Um, at any rate, I was working with all of these people, and all of a sudden, I got very sick. Yeah. And I got so sick that I couldn't talk for five years, so sick that I couldn't leave my bedroom. I could get as far as the bathroom. That was it. Did period. they ever call, uh, get down Yeah, it's chronic why fatigue the, syndrome. I know, but yeah. why? We why does that happen? Well, I, we can go into that, but let me give you the qualitative example of a qualitative change. Movie. Yeah. 
But so there I am too weak to speak and I can't even have another person in the room with me. Wow. And it took me a long time to realize mm. that I had to stop trying to sit up. Mm. Whenever I tried to sit up, horrible things would happen to me. What do you mean and, horrible? Well, um, things like losing my ability to speak. I, my my, my insistence on trying to sit up was doing me in and it took me three years to realize that. Wow. So, so I finally, so yeah. I finally I just lay there in the bed without yeah. trying to sit up. Yeah. And I had two computers set up next to my bed. Right. And I found a Chinese machine that would allow me to control two computers using just one monitor and one keyboard. And I had a keyboard on my lap that was propped up like this. Yeah. And I transitioned from being a real human, mm -hmm. since I couldn't deal with other people. I couldn't have them in the same room. I couldn't right. talk. Yeah. Um, I transitioned to being a cyber human. Okay. It was 1988. The World Wide Web would not be invented. The, the Internet would not become as uh, a, a thing, uh, a mass thing, until roughly 1995. Right. Um, the uh, Google would not uh, come around until yeah. 2003. This right. is long before all of the tools that we associate with the Internet. Yeah, and all going exponential. Right. Wow. I became wow. a cyber human, and mm. um, I went out online all the time with a friend from Texas. We knew each other through the internet. That's the only way we knew each other. We didn't even know each other through the you telephone because I couldn't talk. You were talk. still in the syndrome. Yeah, I uh -huh. was in bed, I was uh -huh. stuck. Uh -huh. um, and, and we went and we hunted down various uh, treatments for CFS, for the illness we both had, she 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 no, she was no. better off than I was okay, at the right. time. Uh, you were a real yeah case. basket case. Basket case. And and we managed to hunt down the things that eventually would make me better. Now mm. think about this for a moment. Well, that's a if qualitative this, change yes, for you if, individually. But, but yeah. if this had mm. happened to me ten years earlier, yeah. You couldn't I have, have done anything. No, I yeah. couldn't have done any you'd of it. Still be, and a, you'd and a still whole be, world, yeah. a whole landscape yeah. that was available to right. me yeah. would not have and been there. And you flowered so since yeah. because you're, you're writing really cutting edge stuff. Yeah. So is yeah. that a qualitative change That's a qualitative in the possibilities change of being in you. human? In your, no, in your but, but, expression but the, for an individual. In me it was, to me, it was but happening evolution. more dramatically yeah. than for most of us. But it was happening to all of us. We were all gaining access to this whole sphere this entire planet that hadn't existed before, the cyber planet, okay. where we could relate to each other in well, ways we could never have related before. Going back to Turing. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's yeah. so different from, I became part, for example, of a philosophy of history group mm. that was run by a guy in um, Siberia. Uh -huh. Now, in the old days, when people like Erasmus yeah. were setting up groups, they yeah. were based on that post system, uh -huh. um, the system of having post horses at periodic yeah. Yeah. Uh, intervals. Right. And it took days or weeks no. to get a message from one person to another. Yeah. Well, now I could do messages back and forth to Siberia yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 I yeah, wrote an yeah. email, I sent it, 15 minutes later I could get back an answer. Yeah. We could have <laughs> wild frantic arguments about Edward Said. I was thrown out of the group. Um, mm -hmm. They all said, oh, good old Edward. And mm. I thought, Edward Said's a monster. Mm. And, uh, Edward Said? Yes, oh, oh, yes. And yeah, when yeah, I said yeah. that, they threw me out of the group. But all at this Columbia. Could he was at Columbia. Yeah, he yeah, was at yeah. Columbia, but yeah. these people were in Siberia. Yeah, right, okay. And But the point is, in the days before the internet, a 24-hour period in which Edward Seed's name is brought up, it uh -huh. becomes wildly uh, bandied about by people in South Africa, Australia, um, Japan, and Europe, <coughs> uh, not to mention Siberia, yeah. and then an American member of the group says, but I don't like Edward Said," and is immediately thrown out of the group, all of that happening in 24 hours, uh -huh. sorry, that could not happen only 10 years well, earlier. So you're making a good case for the information technology revolution. Yeah, and it has, changed, it has changed. It has changed. Well, it's coming to a. It's coming to a. It's like that. It seems to me, if I may, Howard, yeah. every day right. now comes, and it's coming. It's coming. Um, it's coming exponential. Right. It's coming every day. Come dozens of new breakthroughs in every right. field, everywhere. It's like a quickening in a pregnancy. Right. Women would know. Right. It's a, it's a quickening. It's coming to a, right. a, a, a final Asian, and that would be leading to a qualitative transformation. Right. A major qualitative transformation on a systems term in universe is if we get down, as I posited. It would be a whole systems thing, an opening upon something that is closing quotes, 
on 200,000 years of our existence as a species right. within the larger context. Right. That would be a qualitative well, you, major change you know which the trans, has not yet occurred. Well, you know the transhumanists say that we're about to become transhuman. Well, we're tra about tra okay, I don't know that well. Transhuman would be... Something, that we're going to take one of those... So uh, we cannot use the term, we're coming, we're, we're speciating, we're going through it, we're going through this tri the, the, the process that is so slow, yeah. in evolutionary terms, wide awake now. Right. And Joyce talked of that. Right. And, full, and McLuhan. Right. We're going through the thing wide awake. We're now aware of the fact that we are going into another level of consciousness in universe that is transcendent to what we've been for 200,000 years as a right. collective species called Homo sapien, call it Homo. Uh, uh, we're coming into a new relationship to the cosmos. And if not, could we axiomatically accept that that will at some point happen if it isn't now uh, there is a case to be made, including the in the uh, the internet and all that technology, right. information technology. But it's also biology. It's all also all these other fields. And we're at a time either where we can stop right evolutionary process in this universe right the leading edge of it right, or we can liberate the entire Homo sapiens species in a way that we have a capability of doing, which is equally significant on the living side. I think one of the things the that's going to carry us... The of moment, a right. moment of qualitative transformation. Well, I, as you can see, I believe that things like the internet... You're a, and, you, you believe... Oh, you, I'm a positivist. You're, 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 you're optimistic yes. for the human process. Oh, yes, absolutely. You don't think there's any chance we're going to blow it up. Oh, I think there's a good chance we could blow ourselves up, but I don't want to see it. I certainly don't want to see it. Oh, but um, but it is but it that's unique. Right. We can we can we have transcended is very real for, right. us, for economics right. and forms all the politics and everything. We very well may have collectively transcended material scarcity. Right. As an ontologic reality right. for the Homo sapien species within a largely conceived ecological well, context. Well, for every or we have on the other side the ability we do have the ability which you've never had right. to be able to stop conscious evolution right. by wiping out the homo sapiens right. species with the weapon. Right. That's a pop period that's only applied in both cases till about the year 1970. Right. Making a case for this being not just a quantitative a right. long history in the enlightenment and in right. Rome and right. you know that that it's a quality a time of qualitative transformation in evolutionary terms. Well, I think one of the big steps in changing us all mm. is going to be um, coming to take for granted that habitations in space, you can make a habitation in space that's four miles in diameter and 20 miles long. It's called yeah. an O'Neill cylinder. Yeah. And you can Gerard put it, yes, and you can put it in a position L Lagrange where, point. right, where it yeah. rotates so that yeah. it creates its own gravity. Yeah. It has unending energy because it can scoop up the energy of the sun. Uh -huh. um, and it gives five million square miles of territory, territory for firms, territory for parks, yeah. territory for backyards, front yards, and gardens on the side of that your house. That would be like physically going into space. What about, what about the thing is synergy, the behavior of systems, and it seems there's nothing but resonance, even at a molecular level, between uh, non-isolated, uh, there, there's a resonancy that inter-accommodates systems and so forth. Why would it not be that in our relationship to the broader cosmos that we have to move physically into the, into the wider universes that may exist or something? But what it would be would be a resonancy of, uh, of, a, of a... Imagine a world where every human being is able to realize their absolute full potential. Right rather than be so truncated in what they're able to realize, as right. has been the case throughout the whole experiment, right. uh, zero sum. If you win, I have to lose. Right. I'll conquer you, you conquer right. me, we'll fight, all this kind of stuff. But if everybody was doing it, uh, realizing their full potential, there's 100 trillion cells in the human organism, right. about 90% of them are bacteria in the gut, and every cell matters. Every cell operates in a synergistic residency, or you did popular music. When people get into a music thing and everybody's hitting, hitting full tilt boogie right. in terms of their instruments, there's a resonatingly something more right. than the sum. If you have a liberated humanity, there would be a resonancy that would accommodate us to universe at a level that is not available to us as we're still in the womb. 
but it will be a resonance that inner accommodates to the outer environment rather than physically moving out with a lot of clunky materials that we don't need. Well, Do you understand what I'm absolutely. saying? Absolutely, we need to move out there, and we need to no, move. No, that would be a consciousness. I know, but that we would inter-accommodate. It's us. not enough to do that. It's I mean, they're still look. They're still O'Neill's. Uh, they're still. Uh, they're still looking for SETI. They're still looking for intelligent right. radio waves. Or well, look, there's a whole universe up there. Look, what has life shown as its most fundamental tendency over the course of the last 3.5 billion years? It is imperialistic. It is colonialistic. It is ambitious. Um, it is. Greedy, it wants you, you, to grab you, for all of life, not just yeah, human. Yeah, all of yeah, life. Yeah, okay. And it yeah. wants to, it wants to take as many inanimate molecules and atoms as it possibly can grab hold of, uh -huh. and impress them, seduce them, recruit them into the process of life, make them part of the grand enterprise right. of biomass. And right now, life, to the best of our knowledge, life has only had that opportunity <coughs> with one tiny little pill of a planet. But there is a species on that planet. There are many species with many different capabilities. Yeah. But there's only one species on that planet that is capable of taking life beyond eight and, to, to the eight and a half minute point above our heads, just an eight and a half minute trip above our yeah, heads know, yeah. beyond the gravity well, mm -hmm. and taking life out there to build O'Neill cylinders, uh, to terraform the Mar Mars and the moon, to take life to green the galaxy, to garden the cosmos. Well, that's vision, yeah. And the species that can do that is us. Uh huh. Um, you think we're going to be able to do that? And uh, there's no point in looking at it as a collective thing where you've got to get everybody, in a certain sense, liberated through the capability that is newly available to us of transcending. There's enough. Right. There's never been enough. There's enough. Humans to are build. fortunately built with a sense that there is never enough. No, that no, 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 no. Yeah, but that's no. That that yeah. can be asserted. Right. Economics, which informs all politics and everything, we've got right. the debt crisis and right. all that stuff. This is the news. Uh, is defined as the allocation, uh, the science of the allocation of scarce resources. What about the allocation of uh, abundant resources? Um, what if there is enough for yeah. all and the ecology, and it's a new capability that we can build this system so that like a re like a, a, a finely tuned individual that's in good shape is able to relate to the broader cosmos? Um, oh, uh, we're out of time, I guess, <laughs> and everything. We're out of time. That's oh the time. We don't have enough yes, time. But I, I have a feeling we're coming to that kind of a thing. I don't know about the moving out into space, maybe. Yeah. But I don't know. I think it would be a more a matter of the liberation of the entire Homo sapiens species and get a residency like a Philharmonic orchestra. Right. It but would be nice. That's just a thought. Yes. It would be, we live in an amazing time. Right. Your pleasure to have had the perception of Howard Bloom, major intellectual. And let's show once more the book. Um, it's called. That's an assumption that is absolute. Uh, the God. Uh, the God problem. How a godless cosmos creates. I think the idea of God or something ought to be up on the table in order to deal with a lot of the spiritual traditions. So it's a little too absolutist for me. How a godless to say God? There may be, because synergy is the behavior system yeah. unpredictable, and that synergy may reveal God. We are God in the process of becoming. No oh, question maybe, about yeah. it. Anyway, your pleasure. Good to see you again, thank Howard. Thank you, Harold. The beginning. We got to do more talk like this. And thank you for viewing. That's it. Uh, tune in again. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. That's it from our new studios at the at the schoolhouse at the firehouse here on 104th Street.